Okay, so those of you that did not watch the video, there was a guy in the video who was a deputy. Actually, he used to be the deputy minister for finance. And he is now minister of state for finance at the office of the president. And he met an investor or somebody that pretended to be an investor in a hotel room in Dubai. And the sheikh was interested in investing in the banking sector in Ghana. In fact, he had $500 million that he wanted to invest. So anyway, he meets this guy, and he wanted his 20% cut out of the $500 million. So here you are, a leader of a country, a country that is starving for employment, a country that is in financial crisis, and somebody is bringing in money to invest to hire pe- so that you can, they can hire people. And you are thinking about how you are going to get 20% out of that. The bad part is that he uses the vice president's name. So the vice president will like an appearance fees of $200,000 because he has five or six siblings that will be involved in the project. They all need a piece of the pie. Now, you are all going to be tempted as leaders. Money is good. But you have to think about your integrity. Your integrity is that aspect of you. It's how you behave when nobody is watching. That's really what it is, because that really defines who you are. So I remember when I was working in the U.S., one day a guy came up to me, came to my office. I was at Siemens at the time. And he said he wanted to have lunch with me. So we set up the lunch meeting. I said, what is it that I can do for you? He said he wants to do business with Siemens. And he wants to know if I can facilitate it. And I said, what kind of business is that? He said, oh, software. And I said, but there are processes involved if you want to become a preferred vendor For Siemens, you have to follow a process. I'm not in charge of that process. In fact, I can't actually help you because I'm in research and development. They're talking about procurement, logistics, and supply chain stuff. So you need to go to HR. He said, oh, you know, but you are the director. You can." I said, I really cannot help you, even if I wanted to help you. Then he said, you know, when I land that first contract, I can buy you a yak. I said, I don't need a yak. (laughs) I can't even swim, you know. But that is serious because it took me about maybe three, four years for me to actually realize what happened that day. So it was a guy that I was trying to get fired. I was trying to get the guy fired. And he tried to set that up. He was trying to give me the integrity test. And why was he doing that? Because he believes that you could buy Africans, you know. So he's profiled me psychologically He knows that if he can get somebody to throw a little money at me or a promise of money, 
I was going to compromise my integrity. And then I get fired instead of him. But I didn't survive because I was, the, I was brilliant or I, I outsmarted him. I survived because I couldn't help him. <laughs> I wasn't in a position to help him even if he had put a million dollars on the table. I couldn't help him get a contract. Siemens is such a rigorous organization. You can't just jump in and out of things. Then about six years ago, I got a call from this guy who claims he met me at the airport in Amsterdam. He said, oh, you know, you don't remember me. I said, I don't remember you. But you gave me your business card. I said, I give business cards out all the time. It's not everybody I remember giving a business card to. But can I help you? He said, oh, you know, I work for Bue or Bue Dam or something like that. I'm the procurement manager. I said, okay. How can I help you get to your point? He said, oh, I even brought my daughter to a chassis or something and we met you. I said, okay, make your point. He said, I have this deal, you know. Uh, we're about to buy some equipment and I can give you the contract and uh, you can get like 60% margins and then you can cut me a deal in the back. I said, wow, that sounds interesting. What do you say you do again? He explained. I said, did you say you met me in the Netherlands? He said, yes. And I gave you my business card? He said, yes. Yes. Did my business card say I was into procurement and logistics? <laughs> and he said, no. I said, get the fuck off the phone. So you, you will get these things all the time. So, you know, a couple of people keep asking me, you know, how was college? How did you manage time? The last time somebody even asked me if I had a girlfriend, right? Who was that? There was somebody in this zone here. <laughs> Who was that? Oh, okay. Did I answer your question satisfactorily then? No? Okay. So hopefully today you get some answers. So look, you know, one of the things that we keep emphasizing is critical thinking, finding your way through life yourself, getting your own experiences um, reading, reading a lot, but formulating your own views about life. Um, not following things blindly. You know, I'm sure some of you, some buses pick you up on the weekend, take you to churches, take your money and bring you back. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, if, if that's what works for you, that is fine. But, you know, as you grow, as you grow up, as you experience things, you have to form your own worldview, you know. So yesterday I, was it yesterday or today? Yesterday I met with my registrar and I was telling her a few things about how I look at life. How I look at life. And I read a lot. And I write. And four things have worked for me quite well. I've shaped my philosophy around what I call SAPA, which is supper. The last most important meal of the day. And the S there for me stands for structure. You have to be structured. If you want to be successful, if you want to be successful, you have to have structure. You should know where your keys are. You should know where your car is parked. You should know where your shirt is, where you're dressed, where you put your shoes. Because even your homes are organized that way, right? When it's time to sleep, you don't go sleep in the bathroom unless you are high or something, you know? (laughs) 
right? When you walk into a kitchen, you know where the knives are, where the forks are, where the plates are, right? Sometimes when you go to some homes, you see a cupboard and you have all this nice chinaware packed very nicely. And it looks beautiful, doesn't it? So a structured life also looks pretty, right? So when I put my keys down at home and I come and I, I don't find them, I'm livid. Because anytime I have to search for something, I am so stressed and tired that I need structure. You have a timetable from the registry, that is structure. When you get up at 8, you know where you need to be. You know which homework is due when. I hope so. (laughs) Right? So structure is very, very important. When you come to write your final year project, if you don't have structure, you find yourself all over the place, scattered. Now, I'm not saying being scattered is not, is a bad thing. In fact, sometimes being scattered is somebody's structure. Right? So, before I got married, you walk into my apartment and you see all the technical papers scattered in my living room. But in that chaos, I knew where everything was. Walk in purpose. So I can do Then I got married. And one day I came from work and my wife walks me into the study. She said, I have something to show you. I said, what? She said, you won't believe it. That whole room is organized. And I walk in and I say, holy shit. <laughs> You've delayed my PhD by two years. <laughs> But guys, from my perspective, again, that's why I started with critical thinking. It doesn't mean what I'm saying is in a textbook that you go and read. It's for you to end up formulating your own worldview. Okay. So the A in supper for me is ambition. You have to desire something, right? You have to be ambitious about something in life, something that you want to achieve, something that you want to work hard towards, something that you wake up to every single day wondering how to get it right. Now, without structure, your ambitions will be all over the place. And you don't have enough time in your life to do everything. But you have to be ambitious. You are here because you have an ambition to do something great with your life. Okay? Then there's P in there for me. And the P is priority. So you have structure, you have ambitions, you have priority. What is most important to you? And that comes to the question the young lady asked me in the last class. How did I manage time? You will realize that when you want something bad enough, you make time for it. Right? Those that smoke weed, right? They find time. They go outside the walls of this place. I know who you are. (laughs) Right? Some of you cannot look me in the face. Look, we've all been to college, you know. We know this game. So people make time for the things that are important to them. Even animals make time for the things that are important to them. Some male dogs who travel half the country in one night. (laughs) This is serious stuff. You know, so if college is a priority for you, you will make time for it. If being successful in college, if first class is important to you, you will get first class. So you can read all you want about time management, how to allot your time for the things that you do. 
but if they are not priority for you, it will not work out. So today I want you to ask yourselves, what is important to you? That's a starting point. You know, some, I've met people in college that in the second year, they have not even declared their major. You ask them, why are you in college? You say, my mom wants me here. Six years later, when you come back, they are still in college because mom still wants them there. They don't have priorities. They don't have ambitions. Somebody else is dreaming for them. The last one for me is access. So S-A-P-A, right? Sapa. It's access. How do you know the decision makers that you need to get to? You know, when I first appeared in this class, I told you guys that 99% of the things we'll say in this leadership series will go through one year and come out of the other. In 25 years, 80, 85% will come back to you because you've now gone into life to experience some of these things. And you're like, wow, that class is probably the most important class I ever took in college. For me, leadership was the most important class I took in, in college because I got the opportunity to experience other people's experiences. That shaped my journey because you don't have enough time to experience everybody else's experience, but you can hear their story, right? And that is very important. So A for me is access. And what is that? And I started this by telling you guys, this is not in a textbook. I'm sharing my own journey with you guys, right? How I evolved to be your president. So, you know, a couple of months ago, I was trying to get a president, a former president, and he was supposed to be here today, right? But he'll come. He's going to come. He's going to come before you go on holidays. And I went to so many people, and it wasn't possible. And then I'm thinking, what is the best way to get to him? I took another route, and that was the shortest possible route. And in 12 minutes, after meeting him for 12 minutes, he agreed to come. So on my way, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe leadership is like an onion, right? Everybody knows what an onion is, right? You keep peeling it, and it has layers and layers and layers and layers until you get to the center of the onion, and it looks like what? Garlic, right? You can't peel it any further. That's the power guy. That's the strong guy. And then all the layers are the people that believe they have access to him, right? So just imagine you are at the outside, the outermost part of the onion, and that person is telling you they have access to the garlic part. <laughs> Do they really have access? They don't. But that is what tends to happen. When we want access, those are the gatekeepers that we deal with and they keep holding you back and holding you back. And the real people are the layer just before that garlic center. So when I say in my journey, that A in access it's the little time you spend doing research to find out exactly who has the power and deal with those people, not the little people. That's what guarantees you success. You know, you guys saw the vice president when he came here for the inauguration, right? Before that, I made two attempts to see him and it wasn't possible until I found the layer that was close to the center. And in the 30 minutes I was with him and invited him, 
He said, yes. I was surprised. So when I came back, I had to send him a message to confirm. He said, I will come for your inauguration. And he did, right? There was no appearance fees. Okay? There was no appearance fees. You can be rest assured. He's an honest man, as honest as a politician can be. He's a good guy. <laughs> He's a good guy, really, you know. Um, I was actually quite impressed with his brilliance. I believe that for the challenges we have with the economy now, this is probably the best vice president we've ever had. And I say this because I don't carry any political party card. Okay? I'm a Ghanaian first. If you look at the transformation in the ICT sector, if only we understand everything that Ghana card is going to do for us, that is the most transformative agenda ever in the history of this country. Because how do you rule a country where you don't know your citizens? Without a Ghana card, you don't know who is a Ghanaian, who is not. You don't even know how many people you have in this country. Now, your Ghana card is attached to your address. Whether it's fake address or not, you have an address. So when it's time for retirement, you can't go change your age so that you retire the day after you die, and then the day after you die because you keep changing your age. People don't want to retire in Ghana, you know. You see an 80-year-old man who says he's 45, and I'm saying, where's your teeth? Right? Now, in the future, your bank account, your bank account is already attached to your Ghana card. Right? And you know what that means? If all of a sudden you don't have a job, but you have a million dollars in your bank account, we can ask you to explain why, where that money comes from. And then you're home. If you don't have a job and you have seven houses, <laughs> You have to tell us where those homes came from. Now you have to pay property taxes. So it's really transformative when you come to that. So that is how I look at the world from those four letters that I need structure. That's why I have a calendar. That's why if you want to meet me, you are on my calendar. Unless your mom or your father is dying, if you show up in my office and you're not on my calendar, I'm not even going to look at you. Because that creates chaos. Now, you can come to my house unannounced, but if you come to my office unannounced, that's a problem. And Kukwa is smiling. <laughs> so you have to be ambitious. You have to want something so bad that it will make you want to work hard. This is the best time in your life. You guys are living in the greatest century in human history. At least you have Google. We didn't. You have a calculator. We had slide rules and logbooks. Right? And you have to prioritize. You can be a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant. Somebody just is attempting to do that. I read that. One lawyer recently, who is a medical doctor, also wants to be a chartered accountant, right? But he didn't do all at the same time, right? <laughs> so you have to prioritize which one comes first. Don't overstress yourself. You, ho you only have one life to lead, you know. But figure something that you are passionate about and put your time into it. So, first video for me. I'm going to be asking you questions, so pay attention to this They always to want to put video. the what behind it. How do I know what I'm supposed to do? The, the question that you really should ask is, how do I know why I'm here? Because when you know your why, your what becomes more clear and more impactful. If you know, like for instance, um, people know that I do comedy, but that's what I do. My why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. 
So I can do comedy, I can write books, I can be in a movie, because all of it is motivated by my why. In fact, I have a new, uh, a new web series out called Michael Jr. Break Time. Uh, we probably just did the sixth episode. It's on YouTube. So every single Wednesday at three o'clock, we drop a new episode on YouTube of Michael Jr. Break Time. What it is, is it's me. I travel around the country and I do stand up comedy in case you didn't know. <laughs> and in the middle of my comedy set sometime, I'll stop and just talk to my audience. And we've been filming this and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. So <laughs> we're in Winston Salem. I'm going to show you a clip from Winston Salem. And I'm just talking to this guy in the audience and he tells me that he's a, uh, a musical instructor at a school. So I was like, all right, you're a musical instructor. You know, can you sing? Let me hear you sing a song. So this is what happened at the last episode of Michael Jr.'s Break Time. Check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right. So um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, Amazing Grace. Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing. So does anybody know what's going on here? So this guy is a comedian. Right? Goes around, makes people laugh. That's what he does for a living. And then from time to time, he will pause, like I'm standing here, and he will engage his audience. And he's saying that, look, most of the time in life, people focus on the what and the how of life. But why are you here? Why are you here sitting at Academic City doing homework, too much homework? The food is not Taj Mahal style. The dorms are warm sometimes, or most of the time. There's something that is driving you. So sometimes when people have a reason to want something, how they approach it is different from when they don't have any reason. Like a kid that told me that the mother wants him to be in college, right? He has no reason to be in college. Something else is driving him externally. So you are going to see two scenes here. So Mike just stops and then he says, hey, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a music director. He says, can you sing me a few words from Amazing Grace? And he sings it. And he says, okay, wait, 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 wait a minute. Can you sing the same song for these reasons? So he gave him why. And you see the two contrasts in how he just sang it first as an ordinary song and how he sang it when he had a reason to. And we'll come back to it, but let's play that. Sing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That bro could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now... Once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you, you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the that saved a wretch like me.
What do you think? No, what, what do you see? The floor is open. Do you feel inspired? You see where passion is and ordinary life is? Right? You see, where, when people have a reason to do something, the passion, the level of passion is different from when they don't have a reason. Does that apply to your own lives? Sometimes don't you wake up and you're not even motivated. Your feelings are keeping you in bed and your mind wants you to get up. What do you think? It's an open class. There's no textbook here. Comments. Remember what your minister for education said. He said he goes to places and after one hour of speaking, when he asks people to ask questions, they don't have any questions. We don't want Academic City to be such a place. What do you think? I saw some of you clapping your hands. Amazing Grace is always an exciting song to hear. You can never sing it poorly. Okay. Somebody is going to give us some grace here. Sure, there are two hands in the back. So this is what we call active learning, right? So you can see both sides of the coin in real time. Okay. Although the guy just um, went up an octave when he was asked to sing with passion, I agree that you truly are aimless if you don't know why you are doing what you're doing, if you don't have any passion. Because you could see that... um, he was, he was given a scenario where he was shot in the back, his uncle was dying, and he saw that the guy actually had reason to sing. He's like, he actually felt like a wretch, and then Amazing Grace had actually saved him. When the first instance, he felt like he was just singing it because the other comedian asked him to sing. So truly, that is how our life is. There's no true passionate singing if there's no passion behind it in the first place. That's true. Yeah. So if you are an entrepreneur and you are not passionate about it, are you going to be successful? Okay, go ahead. I feel one of the reasons why it seems like we are not motivated to go to class, especially, is more dread. Well, from my experience, it's more dread than lack of motivation because there are days where I can have class for seven hours nonstop and I'm like, I really don't want to do it because I know at the end of the day, I'm going to be extremely tired. Like Tuesdays, I'm sure computer science, computer engineering and IT students may experience what we experience where in the morning from 10.30 to 12.30, we have calculus two for two hours. Then right after we have five hours of data structures. Those are two very difficult courses we are having back to back and it can be very tasking on the brain especially. And so rather than lack of motivation, because mm-hmm. I enjoy those courses, I want to learn it. But it's more dread because I know that in those, by doing them back to back, I'm going to be very f- tired, frustrated, mm-hmm. bent out at the end of the day. Okay. So fair point. Fair point. Now, let me come at you differently. How many hours do we have in a day? 24 hours in a day. So let's say you sleep for eight hours. And you go to school for eight hours. You still have eight hours left. Listen to this carefully. So look at the person to your left, your right, and your back. The difference your life will make is what you do with that other eight that is left. So, your full-time job here is to go to college. It's like your parents going to work for eight hours. 
every single day. In some parts of the world, they even have two jobs. In some parts of the world, people have two majors. They work two jobs. And they are still in college trying to get first class. So, unfortunately, unfortunately, like here in the real world, you don't get too much say. Because when you go to work for Fortune 500 company, they give you work. And nobody cares how long it takes. You have to get it done. Some of the training that you are, going, you are getting here, whether you realize it or not, is what is going to help you survive. If you're an engineer, you get hired, they give you a task, and you don't get to look at your boss's face and say, I've never done this before. If you're a marketing person, you get new products every quarter, and you have to come up with a marketing campaign. You can't look at your boss and say, but Stephen, I've never done this before. He will say, This campaign is due in two weeks. We have to be in the marketplace. Have you seen our revenue projections for this product? You're going to stand there and say, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am. And like Angie told me, step. Keep your feet moving. So, That is the truth. That's the painful truth. I wish you could just take two courses, play soccer all day. But that's not the stamina that you need. The stamina that you need is how do you put pressure on you? Look, human evolution did not happen in a comfort zone. If you are too comfortable, nothing happens. Nothing happens in your life. Go back and check what happened to your rich friends. You are too comfortable, nothing happens for them. They sniff cocaine, shoot drugs, because they are bored. Because doing nothing also creates boredom, right? So, and you know, my attitude about college. It's, it's not in every course that you have to get an A. It's not in every course. That's a fact. I'm telling you the painful truth. Because once you are out of here with that certificate, nobody cares what grades you got. What everybody cares about is, can you do the work? Do you have the skills? And can you work with other people? Two key things. Remember, do you have the skill set to do the job? And can you work with other people? Because you alone can do everything. So if you are not a people's person, if you are fighting everybody, you are not a team player, nobody wants to work with you. But the discipline of being under pressure is very, very, very important And it's part of the 85% of the things I say you remember later after this class. Because you are going to go out there and work. And everything that you are going to be working on for the first time is for the first time. And they expect you to go to the library, do research. They expect you to walk through the company and ask people questions. And you know, what I used to do sometimes when I was when I was in corporate, is I'll just have, I'll have a project and I'll just come out of my office and I see one of my engineers and I say, hey, come over here. Can you take care of this for me? And it's probably a manufacturing problem. It's not software. But I've just given it to a software guy. And you know how many of them will stand there and they are looking at it like, what the hell is this? You know, what am I going to do with this? But what I was looking for was leadership. 
Can you take this task? Go around this company. Find out who has the skill set to help you. And try to get a solution. That's what I was looking for. So even if you're a military general, you see war for the first time, right? (laughs) When you see it. So don't worry too much about homeworks. Do the best that you can. Do the best that you can. It's important. I mean, if you graduate first class in medicine, what's the difference between you and the guy who graduated third class? That you're going to be able to cut human beings faster? You graduated first class in engineering or second class, or third class. What does that mean, really? It's just a feeling. It's an instant feeling, because you have to go out there and prove yourself. So you can see somebody who graduated first class in medicine, and somebody who graduated third class, and you'll never hear about the first class person again. And the third class guy becomes your most famous surgeon, because they have passion. They really wanted to be surgeons, to be successful. The guy with the first class, his parents probably looked at him and said, oh, you're smart, you have all A's, so go to medical school. They probably wanted to go to law school. So passion is is very important. So what you've just seen, think about your own lives. I mean, today is a day of reflection. How do you respond when you have a reason Versus when you have no reason. Why are you studying marketing? Ah, uh, my mom is a marketer. My sister is a marketer and she makes a lot of money. Those are not good enough reasons. Find something that you are very passionate about it. And when you sing, goose pimple, pimples will stand on people's backs. That is important. Questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, please, I want to ask, can you, is there a way you can develop passion for something you didn't have for, like, let's say, the guy who said his parents sent him to school, is there a way he could, like, sit back and say, okay, let me find the good things I'll get, like, and based on that, let me start to like school. Is it possible to do that. So, can you develop a passion for something that you didn't have passion for? That's a good question. Look, I I don't know. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know. Uh, I went to school with a gentleman, and maybe I mentioned that in this class. We went to St. Augustine's College together. We all wanted to go to medical school. He went to medical school. I got something that I didn't want, but I developed passion for it, which is engineering. Um, 30 years ago, I didn't, engineering never crossed my mind. I always wanted to go to medical school. But I went into engineering, got passionate about it, and I stayed with it. Ray wanted to be a lawyer. And his dad was already a very famous lawyer. He said there can only be one lawyer in this family, so... You have to go to medical school. He went to medical school. He was a medical officer at Kolebu. Then he went to law school and practiced law for a while and went back to practice medicine. So these things happen, you know, um, for a couple of reasons. Maybe sometimes we are too young to really know what we want and parents will provide guidance, you know, but I don't know. I think it's just all about the individual. My, my daughter wanted to go to medical school. I think she wanted to do what dad couldn't do, you know. And we started buying anatomy books when she was like four or five years old. Then it was time to go to college. She says, I want to do entrepreneurship. 
And I'm like, what? When did that happen? <laughs> you know? Now, I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story, but she, she's doing engineering now. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, sometimes you, you have to be a parent, you know. You have to step in and provide some guidance. <laughs> she's going to come out in four years and say, I hate it. Then she'll find something else to do. So it's, it's, it's okay, you know. I don't know. Questions? Let's say. Okay, so from what you have said, we have learned that people gain, yeah, um, they get what they want to do from exposure, right? So what if you lack the exposure? You're not able to maybe find anything that attracts you or draws you to it. Mm -hmm. So do you need to, like, um, take what someone else offers? Maybe, like, how you introduce your daughter to engineering? Mm -hmm. Maybe what if she just lacked exposure to Actually, I didn't like lead her to engineering, but... Okay. <laughs> so maybe someone else introduced yeah. her to engineering, right? Yeah. And maybe she fell for it. She liked the mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. What if she just needed to meet someone else to introduce her to maybe aerospace engineering? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that mm -hmm. lead to a different mm -hmm. priority? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, you know... Hmm. I mean, it's, it's the same question if your parents are not educated. They've never been to school. You're first-generation college. No guidance. You're going to struggle to find something. In other parts of the world, at the high school level, you have high school counselors. So at least you have somebody to go talk to. And they'll ask questions like, what are you passionate about? What excites you? What can you imagine yourself doing? You know, so I had a parent came up to me maybe two, three years ago at the British Council with their daughter. And it was an info session. And the dad said, oh, I want her to go to medical school. She's really good in science. I said, okay. Then I looked at the mom. I said, what do you think? She said, ah, I don't know, but I think medicine is a good idea. So I asked the young lady, do you want to go to medical school? She says, no. Then the dad said, can you convince her to go to medical school? <laughs> and I said, Sir, I don't have a medical school. I don't even know how medical schools operate, you know. Then I said, okay, let's do a little exercise. Young girl, can you close your eyes? So, yeah. Can you imagine yourself five years, ten years from now, what your world will look like? And she said, um, I can see myself in a long pencil skirt with a matching jacket, holding a briefcase, and standing in front of a tall skyscraper. I said, open your eyes. I said, sir, your daughter is a finance person. And so she, I think she's here. She's doing information technology and some accounting. Okay? That's it. End of story. So in other places, you can get help. I mean, you can get mentors. I mean, you have, you have your uncle who teaches at Northern Kentucky University. <laughs> I'm talking to you. <laughs> You can get some guidance. And, and look, sometimes you can also stumble on amazing stuff by accident. I stumble on engineering by accident. And I loved it and I stayed. My friends who wanted to go to medical school continued on and went to med school. Okay, let's get our next video. So you guys know about China, right? It's one of the most powerful countries. And it's not really a democracy, right? The big boys run the show. It's not that ours is a democracy either, you know. Uh, somehow they found a better formula. You don't have to pay voters to go vote for you. And then you go to parliament and recoup your money. That's not democracy. That is kleptocracy. 
That's what we practice. So these guys here, every 10 years, they'll get together and you can see how serious they all look. And they make a decision what the leadership team is going to be for the next 10 years. This past Congress was quite intriguing. And you know, as somebody who is so much interested in leadership, I'm always looking at nuggets of things. You can find leadership everywhere. If you go back and read some of the books that you read when you were in high school, after taking this course for a while, you begin to see amazing stuff in it that you never really thought about them. There's a famous book called Billy Bad and Other Sea Stories. I taught it in the previous leadership classes. It's a high school book in America. It's a high school book. But when you go back and you read that book when you are 40 years old, it's just amazing the leadership perspectives that you get from it. So who was Billy? Before I come to this, you know, Billy was 17 years old. He fled from home. He was a cobola. Then he got on a ship. As a ship boy running around, running errands, he was a messenger on this ship. 17 years old. Now, there were some dynamics on the ship that he didn't understand. And by the way, Billy was uneducated. So on that ship was three groups of people. The senior officers, there was a captain and his subordinates. There was the master sergeant who was like the school prefect. And then the crew, the guys at the bottom in that pecking order. And Billy arrives. Billy, uneducated, innocent. He didn't really know the dynamics. And the guys at the bottom, the crew members, actually didn't like that master sergeant. They hated him. He was such a tough boss, disciplined them. And Billy was just running around on that ship innocently. Then one day, the master sergeant calls him up. He says, hey, Billy, come over here. And so Billy goes. He brings him to the side of the ship. He said, can you see this sea? He said, yes, sir. You see how calm it is on the surface? He said, yes, sir. Underneath this calmness are gliding monsters. (laughs) Nothing survives down there. Only the tough ones survive. Of course, Billy did not understand him. And he said, those guys you are down there with, they are very dangerous people. Be careful with them. And Billy said, oh, no, they are such nice people. They always speak so highly of you. He said, no, every night when I go around this ship, inspecting it before I go to bed, I always have this feeling that somebody is going to pull a knife and stick it in my back. And Billy said, oh, no, no, I don't think anybody will do that. They just, they love you to death. But the guy knew they didn't. So one day, this master sergeant went to the captain and said, last night, as I was going around this ship, I overheard something terrible from the crew members. And the person whose voice I heard was Billy. Captain said, Billy, that little kid that came on board recently, he said, yes. He was inciting the other crew members to revolt and to kill all the officers on this ship. He said, how is that possible? 
Billy, that small 17 year old boy, he said, yes, that's what I heard. So he said, okay, you stay here. He sent somebody to go bring Billy. So Billy comes running. And the captain said, Sergeant, can you tell Billy exactly what you just told me? He said, Billy, didn't I hear you last night planning a mutiny on this boat? And Billy was so stunned, he tried to open his mouth. He couldn't. And he was a stammerer, a stammerer, so it was even difficult for him to open his mouth. So in an instant feeling of just rage, he punched the sergeant in the face. And he fell and died. Remember anger management from our last class? Remember that? Don't let anger swallow you. So Billy has just killed a senior officer in a fit of rage in a, on a Navy ship, right? The military have their own code of conduct, right? So they set up a committee. Essentially, Billy was court-martialed. And after a few days of deliberation, the jury came back and pronounced Billy not guilty. So when they brought the report to the captain, he said, did you guys actually interpret the military law? Because there's no way a junior officer will kill a senior officer and he'll be declared innocent. So one of the jurors looked at the captain and said, oh, captain, come on. You, we all know how we all hated the sergeant, including you. We all wished him dead. The only person on this boat who had the courage to do that was Billy. Can you imagine that? The captain said, yes, it's true. We all hated the, the sergeant. But that doesn't give anybody the legal authority to murder him. That is not the law. If that were true, that every one of us on this boat has to go to bed in fear, that somebody will kill you because they don't like you. So that was a perversion of justice. So Billy was tried again, found guilty, and hanged. So the boat is the real corporate world, you know. That boat for me, from my perspective, is a corporate world. You go in and you have people with different political interests. And any of us could be Billy running around innocently, not really understanding the dynamics. So there is power within leadership. And some of the tips I gave you guys the last time is how do you wield that soft power? You wield that soft power by controlling your emotions. You wield that soft power by making sure that you can work with the people that you are assigned to or under their leadership. You wield it by having your own plan to grow. You have to be ambitious. I told you that. And that's what Angie taught me. He said, keep your feet moving. That's another way of defining ambition. Keep your feet moving. So, now let's come back to this short clip you are going to watch. Yes, play it. Approving amendments to its constitution... That cement President Xi Jinping's iron grip so on the party. that's a big guy in China. The event revealed a new central committee, missing two key officials that lacked close ties with the leader. 
And in an unusual so moment during there, the closing ceremony, China's former right? President Hu Jintao, seated next to Xi, was escorted off the stage. It's not immediately clear why he was escorted out. Can you pause Who appeared to resist? So there is some significant power play here. So the guy that is standing used to be the Secretary General of the Chinese Communist Party, and he was President of China for 10 years. Okay? He's 82 years old. China's economic growth started with him. He transformed China in ways that you cannot imagine. I think he was one of the guys who became a leader in China and did not fight during the revolution. He was really young at the time, or none of his parents really fought in it. And this guy you see over here is in his third term now as president and you know, general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. Traditionally, it was two terms. So this guy is Hu Jintao, the guy standing, was there for two terms and he left. This guy somehow has changed the constitution, which happens in Africa too, right? And he's in his third term. Now, this is the closing Congress that basically endorses this guy's third term. And this guy was his predecessor. You see how closely he's sitting? Now he's moving him out. They're essentially dragging that old man out because there are some disagreements. And this happened less than a month ago, and up till now, nobody knows why they removed him. Okay? These are the really top guys. So one way is he's attempting to humiliate him, or he's telling China that there's a new cop in town. So, look, the interesting thing about leadership is also to know when time is up for you to go. If you overstay, you could be humiliated. So play that video. Leaving as stewards let him away. Video of the incident, which is highly unusual given the meticulous stage management of such events, was widely shared on Twitter, but could not be found on China's heavily censored social media See? platforms. They don't want him to State even media coverage of the ceremony also did not include the scene, which occurred just as journalists were entering the hall. She is poised. What do you think? Is leadership always exciting? I thought this was quite very interesting. Here is a former president, 82 years old, very powerful, groomed this one, he takes over, and this is how he ended it up for him. To show the world that he's in charge, there's a new cop in town, and it's a power play. What do you guys think? Now you see why African presidents don't leave office. Um, so first of all, my first opinion was that this is, like you said, a power play. Um, when this news broke, um, one thing that garnered international attention was the fact that the, um, I don't know how to say his name, but the current president or the current leader of China, yeah, Jinping, yeah, and Hu Jintao, they had different ideas or different views, like types of governance for China. So they had very opposing ideas. And one thing that um, he does is he tends to remove, because lately in recent years, he's been eliminating people from his office. Even people who are close to him, that seem to have even a flicker of contrasting ideas to what he wants. So I think that it is a power play in the sense that he's trying to assert dominance in the, in the sense that his ideas or his views or what he wants for China should be the only existing view. And so not only is it a power play, but it's also a cementing of... His legacy, yeah, in a nationalist sense. That's, that's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant analysis. 
So the question to you is we often hear people say it's good to have dissenting views, right? That if you're a leader, you need to listen to everybody else's opinion and then make a decision. So that's one school of thought. That says divergent opinions matter. And there's another school of thought that says, if you're a leader, it's best to surround yourself with people that believe in your philosophy. What do you guys think? Okay. Two opposing views. This is not a debate. Hmm. Okay. Um, for me, uh, it won't really be a debate because I'd, for me, it's a bit of both. Where you have to, you have to take your stance. <laughs> <laughs> if if I were taking it um, for my st- if it was a normal debate, I would say that it was a bit of but since I have to take a stand, I'd say that um, it's better for a leader to surround themselves with people who op- whose opinions differ from them. Why? Because if um, you are if you are um, okay, let me take an example. During the Peloponnesian, the Peloponnesian Wars, these were a set of wars that were fought by between the Greeks and the Persians. So the Persians had the the Persians were always beating the Greeks. Why? Because the Greeks always used one tactic, which was force through the opponents with a bunch of long, um, a bunch of long spears, basically, and. Alexander the Great, when he came onto the scene, he said that we, I think we should do the same thing, but what do you guys think? But like he told, he asked his commanders, he had four commanders, and he asked what they thought. Most of them were like, let's do the way we've been always been doing. We have more men, we have the muscle power. But his half-brother said, I think we should, instead of facing them head on, we should try and create a pincer attack instead. So, and that's what they followed, and they won that particular battle. So I think that if a leader is too fixated on making sure everyone has the same um, plans, has the same ideology as he has, he won't be able to see things from another another perspective, and that can actually bring his downfall. Okay. All right. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so this is why I think after watching the video, it sort of reminded me about Animal Farm with Snowball and Napoleon when <laughs> Napoleon kicked out Snowball. So Have you guys all read the Animal Farm? Yeah. Okay. And Napoleon surrounded his people with guys who agree with his views. But I don't agree with that. I feel that any good leadership should have... Um, Let's hear him out. I feel that any good um, leadership organization should have people of opposing views so that you can have diverse opinions and then you can break down a situation and come out with the most viable solution. So that's my opinion, diversity. Okay, so diversity of opinions lead to better decision making. Okay. Yeah, I haven't heard from, the, I've only heard from one lady today. What's going on? Don't you guys know the ladies are better leaders? And, um, I I also think um, in in times of like when you are all desperate or like when action needs to be taken like real quick, you don't you have to surround yourself with you have to surround yourself with people that think like you, or else the decision won't be made like in time. Yes. Okay. So somebody is of the opinion that you you need like-minded people around you. Okay, there's a microphone up there. Sure. So, I've always had the view that human beings are an emotional creature, or emotional creatures, not intellectual. And I believe that um, if you want to lead people into doing something, you cannot have a lot of people sharing their opinions because the more ideas you have, the longer it will take for you to make a decision. That's the reason monarchy was a very, very useful part of our history that was where most of our progress occurred 
now that we have democracy everyone is talking and everyone is sharing their opinions and nothing is really happening and that allows governments to take advantage of everyone's voice to boost their personal agenda agenda yeah that's a good point yeah that's a good point okay there's one more hand there and then i'll give you guys my thoughts on this question um, I feel China is in kind of a peculiar case because from great from sorry from Mao Zedong from Mao Zedong they've been they've had a plan of trying to become the superior power in the world by 2050. So mostly when China gets a new leader, they tend to follow the teachings and the plans that have already been made by Mao Zedong. So you have a situation where. Uh, their current president, even if he leaves, their next president is probably going to be doing extremely similar things to him. So it may not necessarily be a situation that they were le- letting the guy leave because he had a differing opinion from uh, the, their current president, but it could have been a different reason because it's very likely that they'll both be having a, a similar ideology. And since both of them were most likely from the Chinese Communist Party, they've probably been indoctrinated into having very similar beliefs, they probably would do very similar things to each other. So I feel like it's a situation where from the from when the Chinese Communist Party got power from uh, Mao Zedong all the way to now, most of the leaders are probably going to be thinking in the same way. Actually, they don't. They've all come in with their... This guy just embedded his philosophy into the Chinese constitution. Look, I think that... Although organizations will always tell you that they are open to diverse opinions, that is only in theory. Listen to this very carefully. Although organizations will tell you that we are very open to diverse opinions, in practice, that is not it. Most leaders will get rid of the guy that talks the most in that room in my professional experience. So that's why I started this lecture by saying critical thinking is crucial. Your own well views are very important and they will be informed by your experiences. Xi Jinping just made sure that The next Politburo around him are solely people that share in his Chinese ideology of what greater China will look like for the next couple of years. Hu Jintao disagreed with him on many, many key points. And that is why he was humiliated in the Congress. This never happens in China. It's still a gerontocracy. They respect adults. So, I just think, look, the way that I have offered opinions in my career, you almost kind of cede it to the leader to take the ultimate decision. And what I would say is... um, I will start a sentence like, my guidance would be, my guidance on this subject matter is A, B, C, and D. I never try to deliver my opinions to the leader as if my ideas are more superior than his. That's one. Listen to this game properly. If I feel very, very strongly about an idea, I will go to him in private. And I'll be like, hey, James, do you have a moment? I just want to run this by you and see what your thoughts are. And in the quiet of his office, he agrees with me or disagrees with me. If he agrees, I make it his or hers. 
If he dis- disagrees with me, one, I'm not humiliated. Two, he's not offended. The same thing in private will sound different in public. Right? So that is being organizationally savvy. If it's a bright idea, he will say, oh, you know, in the conversation I had with Stephen in my office, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes he'll give you credit. Sometimes he won't give you credit. You'll just come to the meeting and he's speaking and you can hear your voice in his mouth. <laughs> but it's okay. He's going to respect you for that. You're going to get your moment. Never get into a situation when you are in a meeting with your boss and you are arguing with him in the presence of everybody else. That is suicidal. Even if he makes a decision that you disagree with, you can go to his office and have a one-on-one with him. You save him face, he'll respect you more. But I think in my professional experience, people just say, I want people with diverse opinions around me, and it's not true. They want yes men and women around them. So if you are the odd fellow, sooner or later you'll be nailed on the cross. Okay, questions? I think we can take one more question and then call it another day. So, what did we do today? We're looking at passion. That gives you the why, your whole existence, the why of your existence, and how the things that are important to you, you will make time for. The things that are important to you, you'll always be excited about it. If you're excited about being a computer engineer, you will not complain about the courses. You just do them. So passion is important, and you you hear that in the music. You have to develop your own philosophy about life. By the time you're in your second year, third year, fourth year, you will say, structure is important to me. I like to be a little ambitious. I can't do everything, so I prioritize. And I just want to cut out the bullshitters, you know. I want to get access to the real power players, the people who can make a difference, not the people who give me a run around. And just remember, those that give you a run around do not really have power. They're just making promises to you, and they're wasting your time. So do you what? Your research. Then we also saw that power is not always, you know, leadership is a painful process. When you're on top of the world, don't forget, one day the world could be on top of you. Diverse opinions are good. How you deliver it is important. The medium in which you deliver it is important. If you feel strongly about an idea, Make an appointment, sit with your boss and deliver it. Never get into a matching argument with him. Remember from the last discussion, you don't get to choose who your manager is, right? Most of the time, you actually find out that you are brighter than them. But that's okay. Somebody made a decision that they are the ones for now. So how do you work with them? All right. So hopefully this is the last time you're seeing me for the rest of the semester. The president, the former president is going to be here at least first or second week of December. Um, That could be your nice Christmas present. But, you know, these guys are very busy. And then remember the video uh, about Anas. Guys, If you ever graduate from Academic City and you are caught in corruption, I'll withdraw your degree. (laughs) Have a good day.